Hello, welcome to episode number 15 of The Outside Fence. I'm your host, Tristan Heffernan, as always, joined by my, well, Melbourne and Sydney racing expert we're going with at the moment, uh, Stuart Balls-Brown. Balls, huge weekend of racing we've just got over. We had Friday night at the Valley, Saturday night at Caulfield, obviously the Golden Rose up there in Sydney. A uh, bit of a marathon for you, how'd you fare? It was a bit of a uh, bit of an epic weekend, but um, yeah, good night Friday night, and then um, yeah, gave a bit back on Saturday, but um, yeah, net positive result all around. So um, I'll take that. I'll take that any day of the week. Quick plug: there's our Twitter handles below us. There, you can also follow Teach Me Horse Racing at Teach Me H Racing on Twitter. Or you can check out the website if you want to learn a bit more about the punt. But uh, we don't have time for any more of a plug than that because we've got so much to get through here on this show. First of all, we'll have a quick chat about the tracks on um, on Friday night and Saturday. First of all, Mooney Valley. All the talk in the lead-up was about the rain, and as, as the day went on, it became a bit more apparent that we weren't going to get as much rain as expected, but we still did get a bit. How do you think the track played in the end? Yeah, as you've mentioned, it got, you know, it got a tiny bit of rain. It, uh, the track started off on a good four before being downgraded to a soft five after race three. Um, so as you mentioned, was a little bit of rain uh, through the program, but it wasn't uh, wasn't too bad. Um, as far as how the track played, um, it was fairly evident from early on that um, away from the fence was probably going to be the place to be. Um, sort of, it was particularly obvious, I suppose, race three when uh, Ben Mellon led on Alfred Oro from the inside gate, and he sort of angled out towards sort of a few horses off the fence, and that gave, I suppose, as good an indication as anything that um, yeah, jockeys were going to try and avoid that inside section. Okay, and then uh, actually a few winners were still able to stay near the fence, but as long as they just got away from that, that inside few horses, but we'll we'll pick up on that a bit more as we look at a couple of the main races later on. Also Caulfield, we're going to dive into the Underwood first, but a quick word on Caulfield because they had a soft six after that overnight rain, and it seemed to play pretty similar to Mooney Valley. Yeah, it did. Um it was once again. It was sort of fairly obvious um, early in the card that the sort of inside few lanes weren't going to be the place to be. So uh, most horses tended to steer away from there, and they probably got a little bit wider as the day went on. But um, yeah, it wasn't too savage. Horse, some horses were able to cut the corner and still run okay. Um, but yeah, you sort of wanted to be out. I suppose maybe sort of six, at least sort of five, six horses off the fence um, and making a run there, particularly in the straight. Absolutely. So keep that in mind as we go to our first race uh, for review here, the Underwood Stakes, because a couple of these horses stayed near the inside in the straight. Uh, this is this is the talk of of the country at the moment, Russian Camelot. I'm going to let this run for a couple of hundred metres because I think a key part of this race was the fact that the favourite here, Russian Camelot, actually worked up to sit second, uh, which we haven't really seen from him yet, but it's obviously going to be really important especially at weight for age level that he can take up a position i'll uh i'll pause it here that's my yeah i was really keen to see that part of the race balls anything else about where they settled that we can plus or minus any of these horses um not massively i suppose of note is that arcadia queen sort of used that inside gate to settle a lot closer than she did over that shorter distance at flemington so she settles on the leaders back there in those pink and white colors um, and I suppose another bit of surprise was that Harbour Views um, in the OTI colours, who's currently last at the moment, did settle last. I sort of had it possibly settling in the first four, but um, didn't jump great and they've, they've ended up riding it sort of fairly negatively. And on, on his inside is Humidor, who uh, runs yet another good race. Okay, obviously, all the talk out of this is, is Russian Camelot. Um, first of all, I just want to hear from you what you think of the strength of this race, because obviously this is a horse looking at the absolute pinnacle of our spring racing. Um, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a contentious issue at the moment. Has he beaten anything here? Whether you can take anything away from his win on that basis? Well, do you have any personal opinion on this? Issue balls? Yeah, I, I certainly don't think it's the strongest Underwood stakes I've ever seen. Um, and Russian Camelot, I assume, will um, face uh, better horses um, as he gets to the, towards and to the Cox Plate. Um, like, as you mentioned before, I think the biggest part of this race is that um, Russian Camelot's shown his tactical versatility, being able to sit outside the leader. So that's particularly in weight for age racing. That's a huge plus for this horse now that um, he's been able to sit outside the leader and settle fairly well, not, not sort of the strongest tempo either. So, um, 
sort of they can now, depending on how they see a race shape, they can um, sort of mix and match where how they want to how they want to race the horse. Okay, I'm going to pause it here because this is where Russian Camelot, from that position out the outside the leader, he was able to get out to the middle of the track in the straight, which was pretty agreed on as, as the best going. As we see the place get as Acadia Queen, there Willie Pike decides to stay near the inside, and then Humidor comes through. Comes around Arcadia Queen, but does stay nearer to the inside as well. Um, do you think that adds any merit to these runs back on the inside, or if the jockeys are happy to be there, maybe we take that on face value and, and they've gone about as good as they can go? Maybe a tiny bit of merit, but I don't. I don't think it obviously was the difference between winning or losing. Um, Rush and Camelot was a fairly comfortable winner in the end. Possibly Arcadia Queen may have cost her second um, if she sort of came out a bit further but yeah I don't think it's big enough to sort of make make any kind of significant judgments out of it okay let's talk a little bit about Huberdor. Um this is a horse who was almost gone and he's able to be he's come out and won the fee and he's now run second in Underwood Stakes is this a massive blight on our weight for age racing or is is this a horse who's, who's got back somehow to, to near his best form, remembering he nearly beat Winks in a Cox Plate. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's back to his best form, um, and it definitely does show the sort of, I suppose, the depth of our weight for aid racing at the moment. If we even look back to last year, a uh, horse like Blackheart Bart was very, very competitive in these types of races. So um, I'd say, yeah, he's racing well. He's racing competitively. Um, he obviously won first up at Mooney Valley, but I'd definitely say it certainly shows probably – possibly behind Russian Camelot, um, and maybe very elegant. Um, we've sort of got a very even crop. Okay, and Arcadia Queen, so I was a, a bit against Arcadia Queen going to this level off that run in the Let's Elope. Um, I've seen some talk about the, the wet, the, the soft track maybe not suiting her as well. I'm still a bit, I'm still a bit of a jury out on whether she's quite up to these peak group one races on, on these efforts. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I would on what we've seen so far this spring. Um, I suppose yeah, getting back onto firm ground would be uh, would be a plus for her. Um, but I suppose the thing now is that she's sort of back on track now and um, at the at the same stage now. These other weight for age horses. So I'd assume she probably goes to a race like the Caulfield Stakes next, over two thousand metres at Caulfield. Um, and if she can get firm ground there, then we'll get a great guide to her Cox Plate credentials. But yeah, at this stage, uh, I'd have her a fair way behind a horse like Russian Camelot. Okay, speaking of the Caulfield Stakes, he's going to be another pretty... Well, he's going to be odds on again in the in the Caulfield Stakes. Let's talk Cox Plate. Um, $4, well, he's even shorter than that now for the Cox Plate. I saw quotes of around 9 to 4 uh, going around today. I'm going to go and say, I'm going to say he's a lay at that price for the Cox Plate. We, we talked on the show, I'm a little bit... I'm a little bit against his prep going 1,800, 2,000, 2,000 again, the Cox Plate, still with the eye on the Melbourne Cup. Um... I just don't think that's going to have him at his peak for the Cox Plate, and I think he's under the odds. If you have to back or lay, I'll give you I'll give you three to one. What would you be doing? Uh, probably at this stage, yeah. If you gave me sort of four dollars, it's a, probably a bit of a tricky question. Um, that's what I'm aiming for. I'd probably be backing at four dollars, to be honest. I'd say, I'd easily bank that he's got the um, he's obviously got the Australian crop covered, I think, um, and now it's just probably, I suppose down to the strength of the internationals when they come, but. Um, he's here right now, he's in form um, and he's still a horse that's sort of improving as he's still very lightly raced so uh, to me yeah, as he sort of hasn't reached his peak yet um, and I'd lean towards yeah, taking the $4 but it's not something that I'd really charge into at this stage but um, yeah, given the option to back or lay I'd probably back him at this stage Alright, not a cart, maybe we'll have a sixer after the show on that at, at, at uh, the $4 um, let's move on to the three-year-olds now. Um, we've got three races to go over from the weekend as we go to the awards, the Caulfield Guineas in a couple of weeks, which is looking like an absolute cracking race. Um, first of all, we'll stay with Caulfield. We'll look at the Guineas Prelude. Now, of all the three races, I think this is clearly below par um, in terms of the other two, the Golden Rose and the Stutt Stakes. But the winner here, Crosshaven, he reminds me a bit of uh, Port Adelaide in the AFL because... He keeps winning, and no one's really given him any, well, any real strong chance in the, in the upcoming guineas against uh, some of the other form. Is this fair that he's almost been written off uh, the way he has been? 
Um, yeah, well, I'm probably in the same boat as you. I'm not giving him much of a chance in a Caulfield Guineas. His two last two wins he has had uh, race shape to suit, uh, being on speed and sort of slowly run races or on pace sort of dominated races. So um, he's had that in his favour, which is a great thing for him going to the Guineas, that he can race forward, put himself into a position and pretty much take bad luck out of the equation. But, yeah, I'd be very surprised if he could win a Caulfield Guineas. Okay, we, we might run through this uh, this race a, a bit quicker than usual so we can get into the other two where we see the, the real quality, I think. Interesting point in this race was National Choice, who had blinkers on, had been sent over a few logs by all report, which is something I love. I love when they send them over a few logs, ever since Maldivian took out a Cox Plate after having a, a little bit of a sharpen up over the jumps. Um, and it, also the intentions to lead... Uh, you're all over this. We were sort of talking before the race. All of a sudden, you, you can find a horse at $14 a place here when, with all those gear changes and change of circumstances going for him. That is one way you can find a, a really big price runner getting into the placings. But let's get back to the, the tempo here. Um, it looked like he ran along here, National Choice, but uh, in comparison to the Phillies races, they ran uh, much slower. Yeah, they've gone um, yeah, a bit over five lengths slower uh, to the 600 than in the 1,000 uh, guineas prelude. And, yeah, they've only really gone at a steady speed here. Um, as far as I was the same as you watching it to the eye, I thought they were sort of rolling along a bit. But you'll notice that even the leader gets a bit keen in front as well, um, probably shows sort of how slow they're going. And then um, the, all the horses that were, in, that were mainly in the finish here were the ones settling close to the speed. Okay, so we'll point him out, and that's National Choice in front there in the red and white. Crosshaven, the eventual winners outside him. Amish Boy is right behind them there in the uh, green and blue. And then of the horses to to run on, to keep an eye on, there's Camborne, who's there, um, sort of second last in those bright greeny colours. Uh, he's really hit the line well. Asar, is that him? He's in the blue, blue and white colours. He might be obscured there. And finally, one to watch, you won't have to watch much of him, because Flying Award, uh, this is a horse you had a massive rap on balls, mm. and he's done absolutely nothing here, which is, uh, we might talk about that a bit later, but um, just talk about Crosshaven. Uh, you did mention to me that when you heard the, the tactics on National Choice, you thought that might bring him undone a little bit if, if this horse was going to fire up in the lead, but... Uh, he did seem to get a pretty decent run on speed all the same here. Yeah, he did have every chance. I, I also thought a horse like Prague, who's currently sort of in about fifth or sixth spot there on the outside, would be up there from its wide gate sort of contesting the lead. So I thought there'd probably be a genuine tempo here, which obviously there wasn't. Um, so, yeah, that didn't help my betting on the race. Um, but, yeah, as mentioned with Crosshaven, um, he's sort of had every chance here, has a great racing style, and um, uh, sort of full credit to him um, winning these types of races but yeah we've got well, I think both of us have sort of serious doubts on him as a guineas winning chance yeah so this is a bit of a, what you see is what you get for me with Crosshaven, National Choice and, and Amish Boy there, let's talk about these two horses from the back, Camborne and Asar um, they've obviously had to come against the, the pattern here of the race uh, is there enough merit in their runs do you think heading towards a guineas or, or we're all looking at but uh, second liners here. Uh, yeah, I'd say they're second liners. Um, from this race, though, um, say if these all lined up again over 1,600, then Camborne would definitely be the horse um, that I'd want to take from that race. Um, he's sort of running on through the middle there, closer towards the inside. Um, he's still in his first, first preparation for Mick Price and Mick Kent, but, um, yeah, he looks very promising on what he's done so far. Um, as you mentioned, Asar down the outside was the other horse to get home. It's from the fourth best last 400 and 200 of the meeting. Um, so it probably gives you an indication of sort of how slowly they've gone in front and sort of the sprint home nature of the race. Definitely. Okay. One more. Well, Prague, we can, um, he's run fair Prague, but he pulled up uh, suffering from colic, which if you've ever had a bit of colic, you, you're not going to perform your best. So we can sort of overlook that run. Um, flying award, is it, it wasn't a whole lot of excuses Um Afterwards, they, they said he pulled up. He pulled up a bit sore. As a, Damien Oliver said that he made a slight respiratory noise during the race. I want to talk about the betting. Flying Award has been a really heavily spruiked horse, even leading into his first up run. There were people tipping him for Cox Plates and, and Caulfield Guineas or whatever else. Were you surprised that he sort of started the price that he did on the weekend? 
Uh, not really. Um, are you, are you meaning you thought he was I too th- short? Oh, I thought no. I thought he might have started shorter, even shorter. I yeah. suppose his racing style also sort of holds him back a little bit. The fact that he um, has a history of not being the best barrier horse going round, and he was probably likely to settle well back, um, probably sort of put some kind of limit on his price. Um, but yeah, no, he started around what I what I sort of expected. Um, but the, yeah, the main reason was, I suppose, the map for him and a horse that settles back like that and can do a bit wrong. Um, there's probably only sort of it's only so short they can be. Okay, fair cool. Let's move on to the Golden Rose, where we see this seems like a, a much different quality of Galloper to me up here in Sydney. Um, obviously, all the talk was was Rothfire going into this after his massive win in the Run to the Rose. Uh, we're never really going to find out whether that that stack of money that arrived for him, he started deep into the red, whether that was on the money or not, because he's, he's really hurt himself at the 200, and subsequently it's come out that he's not going to be racing for about 12 months. Um, but there's two horses of note here, well, three three horses of note talking guineas, but the two who fought out the finish in Ole Kirk and North Pacific. Now, Ole Kirk, we talked about him in the run to the Rose, um, it was even raised whether his effort was a little bit of a pot on, on the strength of the field, but uh, having a look at this run now, all of a sudden he's, uh, he's Caulfield Guinea's favourite. What did you make of the race firstly, um, and what do you think of these horses' chances moving forward to a race like the Guineas? Yep, so as far as the race goes, um, the, the tempo of it was a fast one. You'll note um, Mama Reagan, who's in second position at the moment, drew barrier one, and Natural Wheeler really kicked up, uh, making Rothfire work. Uh, to cross to the lead. Um, they've th- put in a, a 1078 sectional between the 1200 and the 1000, which is actually the quickest 200, um, t- t- quickest 200 sectional of the race, um, which has probably put pay to those leaders a bit and really bought in the back markers because you'll see at the moment those three horses that are settling in the last three positions. They're the three place, eventual three place getters in the race. Um, we've got Ole Kirk, who's third last, North Pacific in the white colours, second last there, and then King's Legacy. Um, who gets a nice rails run in the home straight. It's last at the moment. So they're the horses definitely to keep an eye out for. Okay, let's uh, let's run it through then. Going on that basis, is it possible that these horses are flattered? Um, the, the last three here are the first three home. The, the, the tempo has made them look better than what they are? There, there is some chance um, that's the case. Um, they've obviously put a fairly decent gap in the rest of the field, so that's probably a good sign. And you notice here with a horse like Ole Kirk, Um, He is sort of in amongst the crowd at the moment and he does get held up for a run and uh, sort of has to lose his momentum a fair bit early in the straight uh, before getting out um, and then doing well to pick up once the the second place get a North Pacific who had that uninterrupted run down the outside um, sort of joins it. Yeah, I pause that just so you can look at Ole Kirk. He's he's searching for runs here as as North Pacific gets to wind up down the outside and even King's Legacy has the uninterrupted run there as well back near the inside. Um, as you see, in North Pacific, he looks like he's got his chance to beat Ole Kirk, but the other one's fought on. Uh, we had a, a bit of correspondence come in from a Ron Radliff. I highly doubt that's his real name, but um, he sent in a comment for us. North Pacific will beat Ole Kirk going forward. Don't at me. Um, any thoughts, Balls, in, 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 well, in response to that? Uh, well, I'd disagree with Ronnie. Um, I'd happily uh, back Ole Kirk to beat North Pacific again, assuming they probably meet in the Caulfield Guineas. Um, the thing the thing we mentioned there with Ole Kirk, it was obviously uh, held up at the top of the straight and had to um, sort of switch off heels to get into the clear and get its momentum up again against North Pacific, who had that uninterrupted run. The thing I absolutely loved about this win with Ole Kirk was how sort of much it, it's, I suppose it's will to win and the fact that it was holding North Pacific the whole way down the straight, um, even though North Pacific sort of, I suppose, possibly had the better run than it. So um, I think that's a great sign for Ole Kirk um, going towards a race like the Caulfield Guineas. All right, Ronnie, if you want to you'll put your money where your mouth is, I reckon we've got uh, a head-to-head bet online there for you. King's Legacy um, obviously took all before him uh, as a... A two-year-old over the 1400 and 1600. Uh, he's got a couple of links to make up on these horses. Is is that doable going towards the guineas, or is he maybe even looking for a bit further? It's he's definitely a winning chance in the guineas. Um, I think the thing in his favour compared to the the first two were that this was only his third run back. 
um, oh, sorry, second run back from a spell. So whilst the others had, this was their third run back. So he's probably still got a bit more improvement left in him um, compared to these horses. And he, he's possibly a horse that has been set for a Caulfield Guineas, whereas the first two maybe um, maybe have sort of been set as much for the Golden Rose as they have the Caulfield Guineas. So um, I wouldn't put the pen through King's Legacy yet, um, but I definitely have a horse like Ole Kirk ahead of it um, at this stage. Okay, that's a fair call. Um... I don't think there's much to, to speak of uh, the rest of them behind their balls. Obviously, we're not going to see Rothfire, so we don't need to worry about him for, for a year. Um, I can't imagine any of those would, would head down to Melbourne. Uh, yeah, they might head down for some minor races, or even if they do want to run in the guineas, um, it'd be very hard for any of those other ones to um, to turn the tables on the front few. The one thing I will just note, um, as we mentioned how sort of hard they went early, I think the visual of the race, it looked as though horses like Ole Kirk and North Pacific were really charging home. Now, um, yeah, looking at the sectionals for the race... North Pacific, for example, it's run the fastest last 200 of the race, just slightly ahead of Ole Kirk. But it's actually only the 53rd fastest last 200 of the meeting. So wow. that gives you an indication sort of how, I suppose, fast they've gone early. Um, and then the illusion that they were sort of flying home, um, that when in fact they sort of, on a meeting basis, obviously a very strong meeting on Saturday, or fairly strong meeting on Saturday, um, they haven't sort of got home that hard compared to, compared to the rest of the program. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. We really need to to keep an eye on what the expected tempo is going to be in the Guineas, especially considering that the the Caulfield Guineas Prelude wasn't run at an overly strong tempo, and we don't have figures or our figures that we like to use through for the Stut Stakes, which we're about to go into and talk now. But uh, we're gathering that they didn't set any world records up front either, so that might be something to keep in mind here as we look towards the Caulfield Guineas, but. Uh, Let's go look at my horse now, Glenn Fittich. I'm, I'm claiming him after we had a discussion after a Caulfield meeting a few weeks ago. Um, he won very impressively, I thought, in the Stutt Stakes, just dominated from the front, but uh, obviously the Caulfield Guineas is probably going to be a different kettle of fish than a, a seven or eight horse field where he's able to dictate here. Um, what did you make of this race? Yeah, well, I was uh, quite keen on Glenn Fittich going to this race because, yeah, I, th- I thought he might find the front. And um, obviously, it was quite impressive as we went through in the uh, Memsey Stakes in his first up run. And, and the field he was meeting here, um, I didn't think it sort of was of that high quality um, at sort of this stage of the preparation. But, yeah, the horses to look out for, obviously, Glenn Fittich is a horse in front at the moment. Um, the other two horses that were sort of hard in the market were Hollyfield, which is outside the leader. It was a little bit surprising that Hollyfield didn't um, attempt to lead, given he was ridden aggressively in Sydney the start prior when, when he won. And then uh, one of our old favourites is back second last there, Cherry Tortoni, um, who we know is sort of on a derby prep. And he runs sort of he runs nicely here without sort of anything groundbreaking. But, um, yeah, it, it was sort of a dominate, domination from the front, really, with Glenn Fittich. And um, if you're on the horse, you never really had a moment's worry. No, now... <clears throat> what do you make of Peter Moody's comments here with Glenn Fittich? We, he did um, he did sort of talk up that he was going to go straight to the Guineas at one stage, and then you sort of hear him talking that, oh, well, we didn't have to run, we'll come and have a look here before the Cox Plate. He's, he's very jovial. He's been that way since he's come back, though, Moods. Is he just playing this up uh, because he's got a good horse, or do you think there's a bit of truth in, in what he's telling everyone? I'll say there's some truth in it. He seems to have a massive rap on this horse. He was very confident pre-race when he was interviewed uh, about this race, and then he seems to be very confident about the guineas and even even the Cox Plate. So um, I think he's a man you probably need to take notice of what he says. Um, he's generally fairly honest when it comes to his horses and doesn't put sort of sprukes on them for the sake of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I definitely take something out of what he's been saying. Okay, of the beaten horses here, is Cherry Tortoni the only one we want uh, sort of looking forward to these classic three-year-old races? Um Hollyfield sort of battled away there, but I can't imagine he's going to get through to uh, to challenge the uh, the real top liners of his age. No, I, I tend to agree. Like Hollyfield will probably turn up in the Caulfield Guineas, I reckon, but um, he'll just be another on-pace runner. Um, I'd be very surprised if he could obviously turn the tables on Glenn Fittich, and then um, I don't think he's up to those uh, Sydney horses from the Golden Rose. But yeah, Cherry Tortoni's run well again. Uh, his first up run at Flemington, uh, he made significant ground and he's done so again 
um, there. Obviously, with the way the track was playing, was sort of suiting him. But um, yeah, he's going well at the moment. Um, as far as whether he goes to the Guineas on Guineas next, I'm not sure. Um, but he's sort of on his way to a Derby. Um, so he'll get up to. He'll either run, I suppose, in an Amy Vars or a. a Norman Robinson, or I think it's had a name change these days, but that 2,000 metre race at Caulfield on uh, Caulfield Cup Day. Um, and then the Caulfield Classic, that. I think. That sounds like it, the they Caulfield were, Classic. They really dipped into the the uh, marketing bundle there and, and pulled out that name. I'm going to put you on the spot now, Balls. Obviously, there's a, a bit to go under, a bit of water to go under the bridge and the makeup of the field and, and whatever else, but I'm going to give you 100 bucks. You can have on anything you like, in the anti-post Caulfield Guineas market, what are you going to give us? Oh, I'd just split it. I'd probably have 50 bucks on Ole Kirk um, and 50 bucks on Moonga, a horse that we haven't sort of spoken a lot about on this okay. show. But We haven't spoken um, about it at all, I think. Um, yeah. All right, well, Splinters, give us, give, us the, uh, give us the rundown of Moonga. Yeah, it was Chris Waller trained, won three from three. Um, last start won the Dulcify in Sydney. Um, now, the Caulfield Guineas would be a decent sort of step up for it, but it looks a horse that sort of is is rising quite quickly um, and uh, sort of its racing style it gets back and comes home, runs sort of very good late sectionals. So um, I think sort of it's a horse with a lot of improvement in it. Um, and if we get a truly run Guineas, um, and they've actually just booked Damien Oliver for the ride today, so... It's got a few things in its favour there, but yeah, if we've got a truly run guineas, I think it'd be very hard to hold out. Right, okay. Give us one. I like Kirk or Moonga? I go I like Kirk. Okay. I'm going to stick with Glenn Fittich. Um, maybe because it's better bragging rights if I've been with him the whole way through, but I, you couldn't take anything away from him with his win there at the Valley, and uh, yeah, he's going to be right on the speed there in the guineas, so I'm uh, I'm happy to stay with him. Let's move over to the three-year-old fillies now. We've got one race to cover for them, and that was the 1,000 Guineas Prelude. Um, this is a really exciting horse, this winner. Uh, instant celebrity. We see she's out the back there early in the, in the all red colours. Uh, I'm going to pause this once they settle them, themselves out. She, she's a bit divisive, though, here, instant celebrity. Um, obviously, she's run the 1,400 here, but the way she's finished off the race... It sort of put a question mark going towards the 1600 for many people. I'm one of them. Um, first of all, let's let's look at the map and then we'll, we'll talk about her prospects heading towards a mile. Um, first of all, we've got Night Raid taking up the lead, which I'm, I'm not sure she really wanted to do that. Um, is there anything else you really want to, to highlight? How about personal? Where's it in the run? It's yeah, uh, pers- personal behind the lead. lead those blue colours. There's, there's actually a horse here who started 150 to 1. Um, who I think is worth sort of keeping an eye at and it could possibly go around big odds in a thousand years. EQ Menical, it's in yellow and black colours, um, sort of sitting, it, 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 it sits four, yeah, it sits four wide the trip um, and sort of is under pressure sort of on the turn. It's a grey horse, um, but actually is quite sort of strong through the line. Um, so yeah, it, it's a horse going towards a thousand guineas. So it's coming off 150 to one SP. Uh, probably isn't hopeless. Okay, and what it actually did do is give instant celebrity a beautiful little track up into the race. Um, we'll just pause it here. There's personal in the the dark blue going back to the inside. Um, wasn't really much more to see here. I think the key to instant celebrity is is how quickly she put this race away. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's been a hallmark of, I suppose, a few of her races are that she can go from sort of seemingly um, a backwards position to sort of pretty much a striking position in the blink of an eye. Um, and that's a great trait of hers. Um, as you mentioned here, yeah, on the turn when she got that lovely track up, it was able to pull out towards the middle of the track. Um, yeah, you couldn't ask for more if you're on her. I mean, obviously, obviously, we mentioned the, the 1600 next start is the big query. Um, and a lot of people, there's a fair bit of commentary about her sort of through the line and how not long after the post, the sort of pack behind her and sort of caught up to her and even gone past her. Now, if you look at Craig Williams, that last 100, he was pretty soft on the horse. Um, so I, I definitely agree that 1600, like you wouldn't, you can't tick the box yet to say um, it'll run it for sure or. Um, I, I highly doubt in time whether that's sort of its best distance. But um, as we've seen time and time again, those sort of classier three-year-olds um, can tend to run sort of those further distances than you'd usually expect if they do have that class edge over 
um, over the opposition. And I think here, as we'll note, with, say, a horse like Night Raid there's finished with the pack. If you remember last week's race um, that was won by um, Odium, who the, and a few of those runners came out of that Mooney Valley race that Night Raid won, um, you can see that they're sort of all bunched together as well. So I think for a lot of those, if Instant Celebrity runs the mile and gets a fair enough run, I think she'll probably win the 1,000 guineas. Um, and then the rest of them, say she doesn't or finds bad luck, um, then I think it's purely down to run of the race sort of stuff um, as far as who's going to win um, based on based on the rest of the field. That's assuming, I suppose, one of those better fillies from Sydney uh, doesn't back up from the flight stakes. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the Muller. Instant sort of celebrity. I know you're not uh, as enamoured by the breeding as some people, but um, you did follow her mother, celebrity gal. Now, I heard someone quoting that um, she's bred to run it out of a Starcraft mare, but let's talk about the Starcraft mare she is out of. What was her best trip? Yeah, celebrity gal. Well, she was probably more at at, a, at best up up to 1400, but yeah, so she was quite dynamic at sort of 11, 1200 as a three year old. Okay, we're just going to run it through here on the end so you can see what you were talking about when these horses do get past this horse pretty quickly through the post uh, through the line especially personal there um, you're right that grey did stick on magnificently well the, the roughy um, I'm getting the feeling that that you're giving us a, a yay for the thousand guineas with this with this winner balls I am yes but I'm not sort of declaring it um, yeah I I, I know last week, I think I said I'll have the 1,000 guineas winner um, <laughs> That was my next, yeah, I had that yeah, so, saved away, but uh, So, yeah, on. I, I might have to stick with it. I, I would say it's the celebrity, but, um, yeah, where's that horse I mentioned before, Ecumenical, I won't be letting that go around at big odds without having something on it. Excellent. That is going that is going to be big odds. They, they, don't, they don't short them up off those SPs in one run, do they? Um yeah, I'm going to follow you. I don't have a clue with these three-year-old fillies. I'll be brutally honest there. Um, oh, maybe I'd stick with Aiden's field just for uh, for the loyalty factor. But um, we know loyalty doesn't get you too far on the punt. Let's move on to the Moya Stakes now on Friday night. This was this was talked as being an absolute go to worry Hilda Skelter. Speed is going to be on. In the end, it, it didn't really eventuate that way because this flying grey horse from WA, Fabergino, uh, couldn't really muster the speed there early and settled a long way back. And that let Pippi, who we know is a very fast horse from her Oakley Plate win, uh, straight to the front and gave them an ex absolute exhibition in the end, didn't she? Yeah, she did. As soon as she was sort of leading pretty much on her own without too much pressure on her outside, uh, she was always going to be mighty hard to run down. She's an absolute bomb first up, as we saw last prep with her Oakley Plate win. And um, obviously 1,000 metres um, is sort of sort of her go. Um, certainly her go, and she's a very hard horse to uh, sort of beat once she gets control and is sort of doing her own thing. Okay, so the fact that Jungle Edge was able to sit up second, you think that's a, a big tick for for Pippi's chances there in the run straight away? Well, a big thing going into this race, um, unfortunately I didn't back the winner, but I felt I sort of got the race right. Um, I was quite concerned with Jungle Edge and Bella Nipatina, who were both drawn wide and were both go-forward horses. Jungle Edge there in second, and Bella Nipatina's in those yellow colours out wide. I was quite concerned that they'd be sitting sort of three and four wide um, and then tiring sort of on the turn or before the turn, and pretty much sort of play blocker to a lot of horses trying to make a wide run into the race sort of on their backs and that's pretty much how it eventuated if you just keep rolling the race here you'll notice a lot of the horses that are in the fit in the finish for this race pretty much all the horses um get up along the inside and you'll notice a horse like Diamond Effort, who's in sort of midfield with those red sleeves and black and white checks at the moment it's sort of the main one that gets held up um, behind those two tiring horses. But you'll see here they start to tire a bit now. Pippi's still cruising in front. And you'll see horses like Bella Vella gets on the fence there. Trekking follows it through. And then even Brooklyn Hustle follows um, follows Trekking through um, as well on the inside there. And they're the horses who run first four. And you'll see those horses out wide um, are sort of getting held up behind uh, Jungle Edge and Bella Nicotina. Okay. Which is an interesting point considering we did talk about the track and how maybe off the fence was was the spot you wanted to be but uh, all these like you said the first four there they've all come through along the fence and um, I think 
Jungle Edge, Bill and Ipatina getting in the way is a bit of that. Also, the fact that Pippi's ridden for speed, it can be hard when the speed is on to come wide. Um, you, if you're coming wide, you really do need the tempo just to back off at some stage to allow you to pick up ground. But if you're chasing coming wide, then uh, a lot of horses are just going get, to get sick of trying to do that. So uh, very, very um, map and tempo dependent here, this race. Um, what do you make of a horse like Trekking? Um, I don't know if it's going to get a slot for the Everest uh, or not, but uh, he, he he was there to win on the turn, um, but maybe just that 1,000 metres a little bit too short. Yeah, on, on the turn when he got out and got sort of to the outside there, I thought he would, would run down Piffy, but, um, yeah, she was too good in the end. Um, yeah, well, 1,000 metres obviously isn't his go usually he's a better sort of 1100 1200 meter horse or even up to 1400 he's gone well but um yeah you know, I, I think he's a horse who's fully deserving of slot in everest like his last sort of 12 months of racing um has been excellent and if he say he doesn't get a slot in the everest then he'd be a great chance in a race like the manicato stakes back at mooney valley over 1200 meters um he'd be yeah, a huge chance in a race like that okay where's pippi go next do you reckon does she go to a manicato I assume she probably would. Um, obviously, 1,200 would stretch her a little bit, uh, but it would also depend. She'd probably get an easier time in front um, or then, then you'd probably expect in a 1,000-metre race. But um, she did run well over 1,200 in a William Reed last prep um, at Mooney Valley when they actually took a sit on her. Um, but I think she'd be better suited, obviously, leading, doing her own thing in front. But, um, yeah, the makeup of the field would be sort of most important for her chances in that, a race like the Manicato. Okay, there's another couple of mares there who may also be... The different racing styles, but the, the 1200 might be about as far as they want. Bella Vella is one who, even though she won the Sangster at 1200, it's probably right at the end of her tether. And what about Brooklyn Hustle? She really hits the line hard, but do you reckon she can take that out to 1200 metres? Yeah, personally, I prefer her at 1000 or 1100. I know she's a run on sprinter, so you'd generally think 1200 would suit, but at this sort of really top level, um, I'd much prefer sort of a 1000, 1100. And the way she ran, <clears throat> on Friday night, um, sort of getting that soft run and sort of sneaking runs. I think that's sort of the ideal way to ride her. Okay, we saw a bolting at the Mooney Valley uh, about a month or so ago, ridden that way as well. Um, anything else you want to take out of this race, Balls? Uh, no, there isn't really. Like, there's a sort of a few of the usual suspects um, sort of behind that group. But, um, yeah, sort of 1,000-metre races, it sort of can be hard to sort of take a huge amount out of them. Um, for future prospects, but um, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful when using them as form, um, as a form guide for, um, say, 1200 metre races down the track. It's all their own beast, 1000 metre races. Yeah, absolutely. While we're talking about the sprinters, let's talk about Nature Strip, uh, who we've we've fallen for the Everest marketing machine lately. We seem to mention it every week now, um, but he did have a, a trial today after he threw the rider last time he was seen at the track. Um, he well, there's conjecture over whether he didn't jump well or he was restrained at the star. But you've got some uh, reservations about him heading towards the Premier Stakes this week uh, off that off that trial this morning. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, there's a, there's, a, there's obviously a lot of talk about his trial this morning. Uh, like sort of in isolation, he's trialed well. He wasn't really asked to do much. It was more just to get his barrier ticket, I suppose, so he could. Um, race again uh, this weekend um but yeah he i would have preferred to see him jump out of the gates go to the front and do do what he does um he, to me um he was a little bit tardy out of the gates i know they sort of rode him quietly but to me that just wasn't a thing i'd like to see i would have rather see him yeah as i said bounce out so yeah i've got reservations about him this week um obviously he's going to be a short price favor i think in the all-in mark he's odds on um yeah, I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot barge pole, to be honest. Um, I, I know there's every chance he'll probably win. I think the barrier draw will be huge for him. If he draws gate one, um, then it'll be very interesting to see what price he is, considering um, at the best of times he's not really the greatest gate horse and barrier one's probably not the best gate for him. So, um, you know, all eyes will be on that race uh, because how nature strip goes, if he jumps well, bolts in, he probably starts an odds-on favourite. Um, in an Everest, but um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how he goes. Yeah, it's, it's almost like he's he's still your top pick for the Everest, but you don't want to take the price this week because you just want to you want to see something from him first. That's fair fair to stay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because if he if he jumps poorly this week, 
um, then he's probably uh, after 50 meters he's probably 100 to one type thing. Like you, you, a lot a lot is dependent on sort of where this horse um, gets in the run, and obviously his racing style jumping cleanly is a massive thing for him. So um, yeah, I'll definitely be watching, but um, not not putting any cash out this week. Okay, speaking of watching and not pushing, putting any cash out, uh, I've got to say I'll, <clears throat> I'll probably get uh, lynched for this. Uh, I was looking to lay Mystic Journey on Friday night in the stock stakes, but I couldn't bring myself to do so because uh, she is a Tasmanian and I am a proud Tasmanian, so I'm happy to, to say that I couldn't go through with it. But we're going to watch this race because she's back to her best. Well, not back to her best, but she's back, Betty. Uh, they brought her home after two bad, we'll say they're bad runs, because they were, but um, she didn't just win here, she ran down a quality horse, Perfect Jewel, in the stock stakes. Uh, there still looks to be plenty more for these two mares in the spring off this effort, balls. Yeah, but even though Perfect Jewel's been beaten, you wouldn't be disappointed at all. Obviously, if you're like me and you sort of had a decent bet on Perfect Jewel, you'd be a bit flat, but... Um, yeah, they both run excellent. There. You can see the big gap back to third. Uh, Perfect Jewel's a well-performing mare, and she had conditions to suit on um, Friday night. But Mystic Journey, yeah, she's gone brilliant in that race. Um, she sat wide on the track, which wasn't a huge disadvantage, but um, there was a moment down the side where she looked to be just battling a little bit, but um, she obviously picked up. Possibly wasn't our preferred, her preferred firm surface either. Um, so she's, yeah... I'm happy to say she's well and truly back on track now, and um, I'd assume she'd head towards a race like the Empire Rose on Derby Day, which is 1,600 at Flemington. is probably almost her best um, track and trip. Yeah, yeah, she's going to be so hard to beat. Now, we have talked on the show about form reversals, and we prefer to see a little bit more from a horse. We don't think they often go from nothing to, to winning. This proved that theory a little bit awry one thing i will say for mystic journey is maybe it does show um how much there is behind the scenes with these horses and and where they're trained and how happy they were because we know she was in melbourne and stayed in melbourne for her first couple of runs because of the the whole covid drama and logistics and all that sort of stuff and after she failed a second run went home uh, spent all the time at home back there in tassie and then came over just before for this race and she's she's run much better so uh, something like that can can help you find a horse on a form reverse. So you want something really obvious and, and really uh, uh, profound, I guess, to, to to find that form reversal. And that was the case for Mystic Journey there on Friday night. But it's great to see her back, Mystic Journey. Uh, we've got a question uh, to come through. We're talking Tassie Red Horses. Let's let's look at another one here. We've got uh, Boogle uh, seventy nine on Twitter. Uh, great friend of the show he he sent through a question do we have uh, any thoughts on how close Junipau would have gone in the Rupert Clark had he got a run now I'm going to pull up Junipau's uh, race from Caulfield on Saturday because he was a most dominant winner and he's been in super form all the way through this prep obviously he was balloted out in the Rupert Clark how do you think he would have gone there balls and um, maybe we can is there a race we can find for Juna Powell off, off a win as impressive as this was? Yeah, he was very impressive on Saturday and he continues his preparation to be um, a horse in just who's absolutely flying. Um, sort of his, his jump out before his first up run almost sort of told you that he had improved and he's definitely doing it on the track. As far as how he would have gone in the route at Clark, um, I, would ha- I have a hard time saying that he could have beaten Behemoth, but um, I could, would be confident that he would have been around the mark in that sort of next grouping of horses around the placings. Um, he's going that well. Obviously, 1,400 is probably... So 1,600 is his best distance, so 1,400, a little bit short of his best, but um, as I mentioned, he's a horse who's flying this prep, um, and I assume his next run would probably be in the tour rack, um, which, looks a, which looks an excellent race for him. He'd get in with a light weight, um, given he sort of hasn't won anything of significance yet, um, hoping obviously he makes the field. Uh, 1600 Caulfield looks ideal for him, and even if we got a bit of rain um, in the lead up and there's a bit of juice in the track, that would be even more ideal for him. So, yeah, as far as sort of two rack handicap horses, um, he's definitely a horse I've got my eye on. Excellent. He can spot a good horse, Boogle. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him run a huge race in the two rack. Let's, let's move forward now and look at ahead at what we've got coming up this Saturday balls we've got a massive meeting at Flemington it's the Turnbull Stakes Day Um, we're going to see 
uh, a lot of these horses sort of heading towards the cups and, and the cox plate run around here obviously very elegant is the obvious one coming down from sydney um any thoughts on that race early is it are we looking for for wet ground is there any wet ground on the way for, for very elegant that would make our job a bit easier i'd imagine uh, I don't think there is. Um, wow. It's a fairly dry week in Melbourne. Um, at this stage, there's sort of a little bit of rain forecast for Saturday, but probably just enough to settle the dust. And I think it's going to be a fairly warm day on Saturday as well. So um, yeah, I'll be working on a good track for sure, probably good four, up to a, possibly up to a good three, depending sort of how much rain hits on the day. But yeah, at this stage, I'd say we we'll definitely have a good track for Saturday. And uh, Flemington does tend to race excellently when we get Firm ground. We've also got the manifold stakes. The Gill guy looks like it could be a ripper with Zatori, um, Tefani, the inevitable. Uh, we've got Sandra and Elaine possibly going there as well. Uh, the Rose of Kingston for the Mayors. We've got the Bart Cummings winning your in for the Melbourne Cup. That's that's really become a, an excellent sort of pointer towards these uh, major cups. Um, any horses of, of interest catch your eye in the noms there, Balls, to keep an eye on? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, it looks a great day's racing. I'm yeah, quite excited for it, to be honest. And, um, yeah, well, a horse we've talked a fair bit about on this show, um, Shabao and the Bart Cummings. I'll be uh, going back to the well once again with him. Um, hopefully he's had that 2,500-metre run now that should take the edge off him a little bit and he can sort of settle a bit better in the run. But, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be uh, sort of quite keen on him in that race and um yeah should he get beat um there might be a parting of the relationship between me and shabao <laughs> yeah, he want to be beaten on his merits i reckon you could probably find find one more chance for him obviously we look at uh at randwick as well it's a huge day the epsom the metrop the flight stakes and you've talked about uh, nature strip in the premier stakes um anything you've seen off the noms up there balls uh, not really. I haven't had that close a look, to be honest. Um, yeah, generally try and get through uh, the Victorian racing first and then uh, then take a quick peek at uh, Randwick to see if he jumps out. But, um, yeah, not much off the noms. The flight stakes, I'd assume, will be uh, racing two once again between Hungry Heart and Dame Giselle. So that'll be uh, entertaining. Hungry Heart started favourite. Oh, last start started favourite against Dame Giselle, I think, in both uh, their runs uh, back this time. So I'd be interested to see what the betting does there. Okay, excellent. Thanks again for all your hard work. As usual, every week we uh, we got through a fair bit on that show, and not too long, hopefully. So, thanks to all the viewers at home if you uh, have stuck with us here till the end. Um, as always, give us a like and uh, a subscribe. Thanks to those who are doing so already. Give us a bit of love on Twitter. Feel free to send any questions through. We love to get them, uh, especially from you, Ronnie Radliff. Look forward to your uh, response in terms of the guineas, bowls. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Seth.